Hello everybody. We are going to do a relational summary today. And a relational summary is where you read the chapter or the chapters. In this case, I'm doing chapters four and five on our primate ancestry and on linguistics. And then you underline, you take notes and you synthesize what you're learning. And then you write a summary of what you read related to your life and your life experiences. You, you mine the textbook for quotes that uh, energize, excite, or inspire you or, or make you think. And you then weave those quotes from the book and some of the images from the book into a narrative that is really all about you, that is about your life experiences, your interpretations, your thought processes. That becomes then a relational summary. You try, on average, to have about at least three quotes, substantive quotes, from the textbook uh, to bring in outside readings. Again, in the rule of threes, usually about three uh, outside things uh, that you've read. And you try to bring in at least three anecdotes um, uh, or, or ideas from the class lectures or from other people in the class, uh, things that you've learned about them and how they interpret the material in the text, and you weave it together. So I'm modeling this for you this week using two of my favorite chapters in the Cultural Anthropology textbook. And I'm also going to show you how I do it. I'm using a type of software here called SparkoCam. And SparkoCam is about $60 if there's no watermark. Otherwise, it'll say SparkoCam right over my head here, which is okay. And then it's free. But it's powerful because it lets you take what the webcam sees what the desktop sees, or even play a video. So in this case, According to primatologist I've made Franz a video, Duval, quoted in our culture. And I'm going to play that video and capture it uh, through, Ed, uh, through Echo 360. Where did that go? That's somewhere down here. There it is. So the Echo 360 software uh, has the ability to record from the primary display which is your computer screen, and from another camera, SparkoCam can be that camera so that you can actually play a video and have it show up on the other side of the screen. So whatever is on here, let me show you how this works for a second. If I'm using the desktop, then that will appear here. If I'm using the webcam, then that's what will appear here on this side of the screen. So this side becomes the SparkoCam uh, delivery whatever SparkleCam is delivering, and this side is whatever you see on the screen. What we're going to see on the screen is a document that I've done in, uh, this is a program that is similar to PowerPoint. It's just free. It's open source. It's called LibreOffice Impress. And um, I've arranged those slides, and I will play those slides once I set up my video again. So. Here is the relational summary. I go to video, whoops, hit pause, come in here to start it once again, and go to cultural anthropology, and let me get this playing. This is playing, so I guess we're okay. Um, let me get this out of the way. Start this playing, and here we go. According to primatologist Franz Duval, quoted in our cultural anthropology textbook on page 79, Quote, chimpanzees are the only animals, besides human beings, known to use mediators in conflict resolution. To be able to mediate conflict, one needs to understand relationships outside of oneself, which may be the reason why other animals fail to show this aspect of conflict resolution, end quote. Moreover, mediation in chimpanzee society is usually done by the females, they report, who also are the masters of reconciliation in dolphins, another highly intelligent species of mammal on this planet. Says Duval, quote, despite the continuing popularity of the struggle for life metaphor, it is now recognized that there are drawbacks to open competition, hence that there are sound evolutionary region, that there are sound evolutionary reasons for curbing it. The dependency of social animals on group life and cooperation makes aggression a socially costly strategy, end quote. Interestingly, ever since European patriarchal or male-dominated and aggressive Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, and European civilizations started the process of conquest and colonialism, 
the mediating voices of reconciliation-oriented tribal peoples in general, and women in all groups in particular, have been deliberately silenced through prejudicial treatment and extermination. While institutions designed to train and advance leaders in these societies, think schools, colleges, and universities, have created curricula and tests to ensure that the only people who make it through their filters into positions of power are those on the large whole who speak the same language and think the same way as the ruling elites. Education is a form of hegemonic homogenization that maintains the status quo and makes the current culture of conquest and conflict seem natural. Other ways of knowing, being, thinking, and expressing are often treated with disdain or derision. As an example, when I arrived at Harvard, one of the world's leading educational institutions for the elite in 1980, as a freshman, we had to take placement exams to help determine our career paths. I had an ambition to go to medical school and to study foreign languages so I could travel the world and be an Albert Schweitzer kind of philanthropist bush doctor. The problem I found out when I went to see my advisor, Dean Fox, was that despite graduating number two in my high school class as an honors student and having taken the AP Biology and Physics and Calculus exams, I did rather abysmally on my placement exams at Harvard. The dean called me into his plush and intimidating office and said, really, you have no business going into science or medicine or foreign languages. You belong in the arts. You excel at literature and theater and liberal arts. That's your strength. That's where you shine. You would never survive the pre-med program or the sciences. Just look at your scores. What's wrong with my scores, I asked. Well, for crying out loud, look at these exams, he blustered. In science, in math, and in languages, by you got chimpanzee scores. Chimpanzee scores. How mean of him. How discouraging. How derogatory. Chimpanzee scores. So at that moment, I made up my mind in an act of sheer defiance to spend my Harvard career studying chimpanzees. Were they as stupid as the dean implied? Was being like them such an awful thing? What was he trying to say? As I walked to my dorm from his imposing ancient Ivy League office building, burning with shame and disappointment over my broken dreams of greatness, I kept hearing Charlton Heston's growl in my head from the first Planet of the Apes movie from 1968, which I saw in 1970 during its re-release when I was eight years old. Take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! Take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! In the era of civil rights, when we were all discussing prejudice, said by a filthy human in a loincloth in the Disney cage of meat grunting off. Homo unsapiens to erudite and sage hominoid primates in regal robes, who spoke in the tones of Shakespeare. It was intended to jar the viewer's conscience into cognitive dissonance. As intended, the effect on me as an impressionable child was to wonder exactly what civilized meant and who determined the definitions of how and why we became civilized. Was I the dirty ape who had somehow gotten through the fence into the hallowed halls of Harvard, but who was essentially unfit to be there among the predominantly Aryan wasps who formed the ruling class of America? See, I had struggled over this my whole life as an Iraqi Irish American whose people on both sides of the family had been conquered and enslaved or mistreated by the British Empire and its descendants. I looked at pictures of my brown-skinned grandfather who was thrown in jail by the British for writing pamphlets on democracy in the Middle East in the 1930s. I'd read stories about my great-grandfather struggling to survive the Irish potato famine that killed millions by immigrating to America. And I thought hard about my mother's work in inner city Head Start education with our African-American friends in Chicago. I thought about how the British had used social Darwinism to justify genocide and slavery and claimed that their civilization was the apogee of evolution. And I wondered about where, when, and how we use comparisons with the other hominoids and other animals on this planet to marginalize people who are different and to reinforce racism and oppression and violence. Was it possible that the whole notion of intelligence 
fostered by the educational system, was merely the product of a corrupt and self-serving elite trying to justify their own power privileges? Chimpanzee scores indeed. Were the things that chimpanzees did, were there? Were there things that chimpanzees actually did better than Homo sapiens? I had become fascinated by the entire Planet of the Apes series as a kid and watched all five in the movie theater as they came out. Beneath the Planet of the Apes, 1970. Escape from the Planet of the Apes, 1971. Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, 1972. And Battle for the Planet of the Apes, 1973. My favorite game with my brother and my school friends, Andy Millar and Robbie Millar and Ron and Michael Favada as kids, was to play Let's Pretend on our bike rides to Lyndhurst Castle and the surrounding fields and forests, where we would role play the Planet of the Apes. I was always the chimpanzee leaders, Cornelius or Caesar. I guess it's no wonder I got chimpanzee scores on my Harvard placement exams. I used to buy and read the special edition comic books that Marvel Comics came out with in the 1970s, and I faithfully watched the TV show spin-off. The summer after my senior year of high school, once my French skills got good enough, I read the original 1963 French novel by Pierre Boulle, La Planète des Singes, and that's why I was surprised to get such a low score on the language acquiring, on the language acquirement exam. But then the exams hardly test reading comprehension, they test grammar, verb tense declinations and such. Speaking French, I sounded like Caesar in the New Planet of the Apes series, or like Tarzan of the Apes. Moi, Tarzan, du, Jane, another favorite series of mine. I must have read ten of the Edgar Rice Burroughs Apes books, and all the comics of Tarzan and Korak, son of Tarzan of the Apes. I could read and understand in foreign languages great, I just couldn't speak or write or spell well in French. I wasn't good at grammar, I wasn't good at the rules, but I could communicate. And that too bothered me. See, as a kid reading Tarzan of the Apes, I'd mastered much of the language of the ape tribe of Kerchak, the invented language of the apes made up by Edgar Rice Burroughs for the series. It's the language that Tarzan uses not just to talk to his foster mother, Kala, and to his ape family, but to all the other animals, including Simba the lion and Tantor the elephant, with words like Kriga for beware and Bandoro for kill. It was an emotive language. It didn't have much grammar, or actually it didn't have any grammar at all. Through Tarzan novels and comics, I also learned from a very young age about how uncivilized the colonialist butchers from England and Belgium and France had been in Africa in the late 19th century, and how apes and other animals could be actually much more compassionate than man. By the time I got to Harvard, I'd spent an entire decade wrestling with the thought that perhaps we human beings weren't the apex of evolution, that perhaps it could have turned out differently, and that it might still. As I studied for AP Biology in high school, I came across a reading about the 18th century French naturalist, Georges-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, who had concluded that many animals, particularly large charismatic megafauna species like apes and elephants, would probably have evolved to be as intelligent as human beings, but he thought that our species had killed off all of the brightest members of each possible competitor, creating an artificial selection pressure that kept them dumb animals. Buffon was theorizing evolution through artificial selection a century before Darwin and placed us at the top only because he felt we probably drove any animals that could think like we do extinct. That's competitive exclusion. Modern chimpanzees can't get high scores on Harvard placement exams, but perhaps some of their, some of their ancestors could have? We may never know. With these thoughts, I decided to major in biological anthropology with a focus on primatology and evolutionary biology. It would infuriate the dean because it was a science, but it was also a social science with a rich tradition of artistic interpretation and philosophical musings, asking the questions, where did we come from? Who are we? Where are we going? If I got chimpanzee scores on my exams, and that was such a bad thing, something to be embarrassed about or discouraged about, 
something that could keep me from my goals of traveling the world and helping people in developing countries and helping to save the world, then I wanted to know why being compared to our closest living relative was considered a derogatory thing. Why getting the kind of results on exams that a creature sharing 98% of our DNA would get was a subject for derision. I wanted to know why the dean, my advisor at one of the world's leading institutions of higher learning, had such a disdain for, quote, lower animals, and whether or not perhaps he was simply a prejudiced speciesist bigot. Maybe chimps could outperform humans on some exams, for all I knew. The fact was, I didn't know that much about chimps, only that they fascinated me since I traveled with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus as a 14-year-old professional clown for three months, sharing circus arenas with them every day, and watching them perform and hoot and holler as they made their way from the center ring to their overnight cages. I remember visiting another circus in White Plains, New York, and trying to communicate with a chimp and having him throw his feces at me. I could see why some people might not like chimps, but I sensed there was something wrong in the dean's glib assessment of my capabilities and theirs. I was reminded of the following quote from Einstein. He said, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And that from a theoretical, theoretical physicist, philosopher, and Nobel Prize winner. There's this great cartoon that you can see here where a teacher has lined up a chimpanzee, a bird, a penguin, an elephant, a fish, a seal, and a goat. And the cheaper teacher is saying, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. The quote beneath it is the Albert Einstein quote, and it's related to our education system. Now, what I learned at Harvard about chimpanzees when I actually studied them and about other primates and other non-human beings stunned me. First off, I learned that early attempts to teach chimps to speak, attempts that failed and led people to underestimate their intelligence, were flawed because the researchers were prejudiced to or ignorant of the capabilities of deaf-mute humans and didn't understand the importance of gestural languages. Remember that deaf-mutes used to be called deaf and dumb. The word dumb originally meant simply incapable of speech, but later came to mean stupid. People who were mute were often placed in mental institutions simply because the parents or community or schools didn't bother to know or teach sign language. It's for this reason that the superb 1979 theatrical play and 1986 film about the deaf community, both of which I saw in college and right after, is called Children of a Lesser God, reflecting that prejudice. The fact that deaf people had created a robust culture of enormous symbolic richness using the gestural language called sign language was completely ignored by the cultural elites and their sycophants. The contributions of the deaf community were mostly ignored. And that same ignorance was compounded when scientists looked at our closest living relatives to assess their intelligence. But after the failure to teach the chimpanzee, a chimpanzee named Vicky, human speech in the early 1950s, when she was only able to say four words, mama, papa, cup, and up, many had thought they had found proof that chimps didn't have the requisite intelligence for language. But later researchers found out that what they really lacked was the proper vocal apparatus, as shown in the textbook on page 121 in the section called The Biology of Human Speech. When the Gardner family tried using sign language with the baby chimpanzee Washu in the 1960s, it was quickly discovered that in fact chimpanzees and other apes were quite capable of symbolic languages. Washu learned more than 350 signs and demonstrated full comprehension in double-blind tests. Other apes mastered far more. For example, in the 1970s, the gorilla, Coco, was shown to understand approximately 1,000 ASL signs and 2,000 English words. And it goes beyond human languages. In the Cultural Anthropology textbook on pages 104 and 105, H. Lynn White Miles writes about her work with an orangutan named Chantek, who understood human speech and mastered sign language and computer symbolic languages. Most remarkable, Chantek showed the ability to lie. As Miles wrote, Chantek could play imitative games and also illustrated some of the functions of language, such as displaced reference by talking about keys that were not present. He showed code switching by utilizing a different dialect, style, or register 
through whispering secret and making his signs very small in a tiny space, shifting from his intimate information language with me to a more formal communication when the keeper arrived. Chantek is a code switcher in another sense as well, because he's a member of a small group of intelligent non-humans who are cultural hybrids, or dual cultured, meaning he's a member of one species raised by another, kind of like Tarzan. Significantly, I mean, kind of like Tarzan in the reverse sense, instead of Tarzan raised by the apes, it's Chantek raised by the humans. Significantly, Chantek engaged in deception by attempting his escape and by subtly lying about what had really happened afterward. This phenomenon has been called the benchmark of language because it requires symbolically creating or assuming an alternative reality and theory of mind. I learned that Chantek told at least three lies a week, including signing dirty to go to the bathroom only to play with the knobs on the washing machine." End quote. Now, the most recent trilogy of Planet of the Apes movies to come out has updated our understanding of the differences between us and the other primates, much gone by much further than the original movie series, by incorporating all of these most recent discover discoveries into its fictional narrative. And it shows how minor changes in genes through viral gene therapy could give the other apes a competitive advantage over Homo sapiens. Imagine a creature with our abilities mentally and all of their physical prowess. The overarching message of these new films is that we should ask ourselves what truly makes species intelligent. Is it the ability to wage war and conquer? Or is it the ability to cooperate and use love to help us survive? What can we learn, for example, from the bonobo species of chimps we share the planet with today, but whom we are driving extinct, who are much different than the common chimp, and, according, and, and among whom, according to our textbook on page 82, quote, rape has never been observed, and, quote, the primary function of sex, both hetero and homosexual, is to reduce tensions and resolve social conflicts, end quote. The more we use the right theoretical framework to re-explore our relationship with other beings, the more we discover about the different forms of intelligence, and the more we can deprivilege the throne of humanity and the violence of its warmongering power elites and those who blindly serve them. We are finding there are many forms of intelligence, and each has its place in an ecology of mind. Bonobos have a compassionate social intelligence. Common chimps are more like us in manipulative political intelligence. We have to decide which to foster in our own children. For example, it is now known that the spatial intelligence of the great apes far exceeds our own. The LA Times ran a recent article titled, Chimpanzees Make Monkeys of Humans in Computer Game, in which they reported, quote, chimpanzees playing each other in a simple matching game outperformed human players, apparently by paying closer attention to opponents' patterns and adjusting more optimally according to a study published Wednesday in Scientific Reports. Researchers believe the different outcomes could be the byproduct of a cognitive trade-off in the course of evolution. Humans left the trees and developed language, semantic thought, and cooperation, while our distant cousins kept right on doing what made them so successful in the first place, competing, deceiving, and manipulating. Unlike the Bonobos. Ultimately, Evolution by natural selection favors those who adapt to their changing environments, and there are many forms of intelligence that can achieve that. Since our species developed semantic language, we tend to use it to reinforce our power through artificial selection. So much of what we call intelligence is our artificial way of deciding and selecting for who gets opportunity and who doesn't, mostly based on language. According to the Animal Communication Project, quote, we have sought to distance ourselves from the beasts, often using language as the defining difference. In the first century before Christ, Roman historian Sallust wrote, quote, all men who would surpass the other animals should do their best not to pass through life silently like the beasts, end quote. Now the ability or inability to speak, and in particular to speak the king's English, was used by the brutal colonialists to justify slavery and slaughter and social discrimination. One has only to think of the great quote from the angry hacienda owner played by Anthony Quinn in the 1995 film, A Walk in the Clouds, when he says to Keanu Reeves, 
just because I talk with an accent doesn't mean I think with an accent. For a long time, we've associated speech with intelligence, but this bigoted tendency revealed in the 1871 Victorian play Pygmalion and the Galatea, and more famously, George Bernard Shaw's 1913 Pygmalion, made into the 1964 musical My Fair Lady with Rex Harrison and Audrey Hepburn, was well known to be merely a way for the British aristocracy to maintain class privilege. In the song from the musical, Dr. Henry Higgins, who insists he not be called Henry Higgins, laments, why can't a woman think more like a man? The debate that the phoneticist has with Colonel Hugh Pickering about women's supposed inferiority results in a bet over whether he can teach the lower class Eliza Doolittle to speak properly. The rain and Spain falls mainly on the plain. And don't say Henry Higgins. During the Victorian era, there was not only the belief that women and minorities were somehow inferior, but that the poor and people from lower classes were also somehow genetically incapable of manifesting high intelligence, and that the way they used language and their seeming inability to master the elocution patterns of males in the upper classes was the proof of this. In reality, it turns out that language has been deliberately used to keep people from engaging in social mobility. As our cultural anthropology text states on page 109, quote, there is a tendency for any group within a larger society to create its own unique vocabulary, whether it's a street gang, a sorority, a religious group, prison inmates, or a platoon of soldiers, or the elite controlling. By changing the meaning of existing words or inventing new ones, members of the in-group can communicate with fellow members of the in-group while effectively excluding outsiders who may be within hearing range. The societies of the ruling royals in Europe, like those of many ruling elites around the world, created deliberate language barriers to identify those in the in-group He's a man of letters, they would say. And those in the outgroup, those who talk about Iskov. Many languages not only made grammars arcane and illogical to ensure that nobody could master them without being born into the wealthy class, but also used gender-based verb declinations and case endings to make sure that men and women viewed the world differently and never spoke precisely the same language. And as our book points out, the way you speak or don't speak if you're silenced or discouraged from speaking, has a profound influence on the way you come to view the world and your place in it. That's why so many women are now clamoring to be heard and feel like nobody ever listens to them. Nobody did. That was part of the strategy to keep them down. Quote, based on his research on the Hopi language and culture, Worf developed his important theoretical insight that the structure of the language one habitually uses influences the manner in which one understands his environment or her environment. The picture of the universe shifts from tongue to tongue. That's Carroll, 1956, page 6, quoted on page 116 of our textbook. Another quote. In the 1960s, linguistic anthropologists devised new research strategies to actually test Worf's original hypothesis. One study found that speakers of Swedish and Finnish neighboring peoples who speak radically different languages, working at similar jobs in similar regions under similar laws and regulations, show significantly different rates of on-the-job accidents. The rates are substantially lower among the Swedish speakers. What emerges from comparison of the two languages is that Swedish, one of the Indo-European languages, emphasizes information about movement in three-dimensional space. Finnish, a Ural-Altaic language unrelated to Indo-European languages, emphasizes more static relations among coherent temporal entities. As a consequence, it seems that Finns organize the workplace in a way that favors the individual person over the temporal organization in the overall production process. This, in turn, leads to frequent production disruptions, haste, and ultimately, accidents. Page 116. And so we return to the chimpanzee score issue. If our languages actually evolved as a way to communicate how we see the world, but the way we see the world is flawed and limited by our languages, then we have to ask if creatures using a flawed language, and hence a flawed representation of the universe, are actually that intelligent. 
Given that intelligence is an adaptation to our environments that is supposed to enhance our survival, how do we judge the intelligence of a group or a species like us that it's so out of coherence with our environment that we drive ourselves and all that surround us extinct? How smart is that? This is an issue that is brought out in the excellent short story from 2002, The Story of Your Life, by the mathematician novelist Ted Chiang, which was made into the 2016 science fiction film Arrival with Amy Adams. The story actually involves an anthropological linguist who is tasked with communicating with three octopoid aliens who arrive on Earth. She discovers that these hyper-intelligent beings, light years beyond humans in capability, owe much of their highly evolved civilization to their ability to communicate with a multi-dimensional language that isn't confined to our normal, orthogonal, sequential language that straightjackets human thought into linear temporality and causality. They communicate by writing in octopus inkjets in a cyclical branching and overlapping symbolic language that links possible futures to possible pasts and is ever evolving. They do not, however, speak using acoustics. <clears throat> Thus, if you can't decipher their ink patterns, you would never know how smart they were, as they otherwise simply float in front of you, waving their tentacles. And yet, they are nonviolent and have survived for far longer than so-called Homo sapiens, the wise guys, a species that's at best between 70,000 and 400,000 years old. So despite all the chatter we humans engage in, if we destroy ourselves, can we be considered truly intelligent? On pages 117 through 119, the cultural anthropology book talks about nonverbal communication, gestural languages, kinesics, the study of nonverbal signals, proxemics, the cross-cultural study of social space, coined by anthropologist Edward Hall, who worked with Hopi and Navajo Indians, people who were marginalized by the conquest of the European invaders, and paralanguage, specific voice effects that accompany speech, such as giggling, groaning, and sighing, volume, intensity, pitch, and tempo, which was reflected in the comment, it's not so much what was said as how it was said, page 117. The book talks about tonal languages like Chinese, talking drums, as uh, evidenced by many of the African civilizations that the Europeans destroyed, and whistled speech, and shows how many cultures that Henry Iggins and the Harvard Dean would have considered primitive and how they had and have a much, much richer form of linguistic variation than the most erudite Harvard or Cambridge professor. As the book points out on page 121, traditional orators are usually trained from the time they are young. They often enhance their extraordinary memorization skills through rhyme, rhythm, and melody. Orators may also employ special objects to help them remember, notch sticks, knotted strings, bands, embroidered with shells, and so forth. Traditional Iroquois Indian orators often performed their formal speeches with wampum belts made of hemp string with white and bluish purple shell beads woven into distinctive patterns symbolizing important messages or agreements including treaties with other nations, page 122. Unfortunately, the so well-educated Europeans and the Harvard-educated early colonialists didn't understand any of that broke the treaties, slaughtered the people, and created a civilization of complete unsustainability. That's dumb. There's now a rich body of research on multiple intelligences. See the work of Howard Gardner, showing the traditional IQ tests and methods of school instruction have been effectively marginalizing all people who don't fit into a certain mold or way of thinking. The placement exams at Harvard that I took were not designed to celebrate or make sense of multiple intelligence that involved various forms of IQ and EQ, and hence the Dean's division of the world into those who show aptitude for science and those who show aptitude for the arts is precisely the kind of bigotry that has kept Western civilization from cultivating the truly holistic thinkers that we need to create a sustainable society, and therefore blindly driving us into suicidal conflict with each other and our environments. We evolved our various intelligences and the languages that communicate them in a co-evolving five-dimensional landscape that demanded the capacity for both reductionist scientific thinking and holistic artistic thinking and every blend in between. Notice I'm using my hands to talk now. 
perhaps if we're going to create entrance exams and placement exams to better position people for the 21st century challenges of avoiding extinction through warfare, climate change, and environmental degradation. We need to base them on multiple intelligence theory that gives higher scores to STEAM learners, those who excel at both science, technology, engineering, art, math, and music, for example, and are oriented towards systems thinking and real-world problem solving based on cooperation rather than competition. Only then will we know who is best suited for positions of cooperative leadership that involve traveling the world and coming together and healing the sicknesses, social and environmental and psychological and personal that abound, and then be able to nurture and improve their abilities to make a better world. As for me, I actually ended up being able to speak six languages and earned my doctorate in a blend of science and the arts that enabled me to win awards and work with National Geographic and the U.S. Embassy Diplomatic Services and with colleges and universities traveling around the world to integrate the arts and sciences and mediate conflicts in the service of sustainable development. I even got to work with the great apes in zoos and in the wild. I worked with orangutans for a year in Borneo, and this month I go to Rwanda to help protect the endangered mountain gorillas, those beautiful cousins of ours. So I filled, I filled, so I filled and fulfilled my dreams despite the dean at Harvard. And so my message, don't let anyone ever discourage you. Chimpanzee scores indeed. According to primatologist Franz Duval, quoted in our cultural anthropology textbook on page... Oops. Well, that's it for today, folks. <clears throat> that's my relational summary. And I hope that you'll do yours. So keep reading that textbook and highlight and underline and mine underline and mine, mine that book for the gems that are hidden there and then let them spark ideas and emotions in you and then write about it and then blog about it and create images for it and make videos and animations and dances and raps and songs and symphonies and sculptures and is there anything else? Crafts, projects, get involved and let's uh, create liberty and justice for all. Okay? Don't let anybody make a monkey out of you. All right. Good night.